Welcome to Texas Heart Institute educational programs uh, on innovative technologies and techniques. I'm Zvon Krejza. I'm an international cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and CHI Health Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. The topic of uh, today's presentation is uh, arrhythmias and AI in COVID-19 epidemic. Joining me for this program are Dr. Wilson Lamb, he's a Texas Children's Hospital, Texas Adult Cardiology Health Center uh, physician, uh, also working in combined adult pediatric cardiology and clinical cardiac electrophysiology. Also join us is Dr. Mehdi Rezavi. He's a director of electrophysiology, clinical research and innovations at Texas Heart Institute. And also joining us, uh, expert in artificial intelligence, Surrender Magar is the president and CEO of Life Signals from Fremont, California. And he'll talk to us about technology that is currently available and what does the future hold as far as detection of arrhythmias are concerned. So gentlemen, welcome to our Texas Heart Institute educational programs. Thank you. Ben. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Rezavi, let's uh, start with uh, information on uh, arrhythmias. How do they originate as far as particularly malignant arrhythmias and how this will impact our patients during COVID-19 epidemic? What, what, what is the substrate as far as electrophysiology is concerned for malignant ventricular arrhythmias? Uh, I think, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, as, uh, in one word, I would say it's, uh, it's chaos or dyssynchrony. Um, what happens uh, in the setting uh, of some of these lethal arrhythmias is, is for one reason or another, uh, the normal rhythmic activity of the cardiac uh, electrical uh, system is altered. So if we put this in the substrate of COVID-19 mm -hmm. viral infection, and we have had uh, actually our program recorded on it uh, with uh, our former fellow, Mohammed Majid, who uh, published uh, an article uh, in a recent uh, JAMA, that was the March 27th uh, JAMA Cardiology uh, 2020, where he actually reviewed all the cardiac effects of COVID-19 infection. And there are multiple. Some of the important ones are obviously uh, elevation of troponin by itself, either due to obstruction and STEMI or non-STEMI, but uh, there are also several other ones. And of course, uh, arrhythmias are very common in patients with COVID and particularly malignant arrhythmias. Can you uh, just briefly mention how common are arrhythmias in patients with COVID infection. So one of the concerns that increases the arrhythmogenicity is prolonged QT yes. uh, in a disease state. And uh, as a matter of fact, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on this particular item and how it affects different uh, uh, anatomical structures in the heart. So really the so-called long QT is, it's essentially the, what, what I was discussing, the analogy I was using before. It's a prolongation in the refractoriness of the heart tissue. So th that's what you call heterogeneity. Yes, correct. Or dispersion of uh, action potentials. And then that, I guess, increases the automaticity as well. That's correct. And the way that it can do that is it can actually, now you're focusing on a different type of cells. These are the normal impulse formers um, of the cells. So again, the sinus node or the junction, AV junction. And what happens is in those cases is if you have an over, um, uh, you know, high levels of uh, calcium, for example, uh, intracell extracellular and intracellular calcium, what that does is that can actually spark an independent heartbeat and that's called automaticity. And then when that happens, that heartbeat Normally, it would spread smoothly across the heart. And this is where VT and uh, VF That's correct. happens. That's exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So-called right. wave breaks. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, I think this uh, explains, uh, for those of us that are not in the field of electrophysiology, 
what really happens in sick myocardium due to a variety of causes. But uh, nowadays we are concentrating on COVID-19 that can certainly affect the myocardium and all the cardiac structures uh, to a significant way. Uh, let, let's move forward and ask uh, Wilson uh, a little bit about uh, inherited arrhythmia syndromes and how do those patients fare in uh, the era of COVID and what, what cautions do we have to uh, take into consideration when we are dealing with patients that could have inherited arrhythmia syndromes, Wilson? Wonderful. Thank you for letting me join on this conversation, Dr. Kreischer. Yes, at the Texas Adult Congenital Heart Center and the Texas uh, Children's Hospital, we're familiar with a lot of the inherited arrhythmia syndromes, ranging from long QT, Regatta syndrome, and CPVT, uh, most commonly. The Heart Rhythm Society uh, had gotten together and had a uh, publication just a few weeks ago about the things that we would anticipate and expect in these, this population. Fortunately, these conditions are rare, but as we think about the preparations that we have for this population, we can think about the risks that will happen in the general population as well. Long QT syndrome was thought to be the most frequent one at roughly one in 2,000 of the population. And we know that, as Dr. Razavi had mentioned, the repolarization time, the refractoriness has lengthened out, and that makes them more susceptible to multiple medications, such as the tested medications of chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and azithromycin. As you start to add other antiviral agents on board and some agents that we're not sure whether or not they prolong the QT or not, that's where we may get into uh, more trouble. A lot of times with fever, many of these channels can be affected and become less functional. And we know that COVID happens quite frequently with fever as well. Fever is notorious uh, as being a trigger for uh, the Brugada syndrome, which is also one in 2000. And with it, we end up uh, seeing that we have to treat extremely aggressively to make sure that these episodes don't uh, uh, cause that. Short QT syndrome is extremely rare. It's only about 100 cases in the literature. And fortunately, these medications may actually prolong the QT and take them out of the range of danger. So that's the one population that might do better, but there aren't many of them across the world. Lastly, CPVT happens about one in 10,000 patients. And we know that exercise and emotion are triggers, but uh, as patients get sicker and get moved to the intensive care unit, they may require inotropes, such as epinephrine. And if we ever have to do a resuscitation, epinephrine is usually the agent that we use to code the patient. Unfortunately, it's also the agent that's used to prove if a patient has CPVT by inducing polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. This is one of the cases that they caution, you would not want to use epinephrine in a resuscitation case because of its uh, potential lethality. So uh, tell us a little bit about the ACC and the AHA guidelines that were published recently in JAK related to uh, COVID and Q2 prolongation. Sure. Just a week ago, the American College of Cardiology joined with the American Heart Association and the Heart Rhythm Society to put out a set of guidelines for people that are going to be using these agents. They should have EKG monitoring, and if the QT corrected is greater than 500 milliseconds, we should withdraw those medications. We should work aggressively to keep the electrolytes, such as potassium, greater than four, and magnesium greater than two. If there's any possibility of stopping other QT prolonging agents that can be found at CredibleMeds.org, then we really ought to minimize the possibility of prolonging that QT. It is recommended that if these medications are used, they should be done in a clinical trial or a registry where these are being monitored. But if someone chooses to use them outside of a clinical trial, that an infectious disease or a COVID expert should be involved in conjunction with the cardiologist for the monitoring of the QT. Now, there are also other risk scores out there. Uh, a, a Dr. Tisdale developed in 2013, one that you can uh, enter a patient's age, their gender, and several other risk factors to find out the likelihood that the QT will prolong greater than 500 milliseconds, and that might gauge how frequently and how intensely we should monitor that QT. More recently, there were a couple of studies released this week, uh, one out of Brazil that stopped their uh, study enrolling early because a high dose of chloroquine at 600 milligrams twice a day, roughly three times the dose of a, uh, the standard daily dose, uh, ended up having uh, about one, 
20 to 25% of their patients had a QT that prolonged greater than 500 milliseconds, two of them having uh, a sustained ventricular tachycardia and dying subsequently. So uh, let, let me ask you, Dr. Rezavi, this question, because you are an adult electrophysiologist. If you have a patient that has uh, several comorbid cardiac conditions, ventricular, history of ventricular tachyarrhythmias, uh, has a baseline, uh, borderline, or slightly prolonged QT syndrome, has coronary disease. Now, obviously, I would suspect you have to be even more cautious in this particular scenario. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, you're adding additional substrates, so absolutely. All right. So, um, Wilson, uh, let, let me uh, uh, ask you now, there are a lot of drugs that uh, can prolong QT syndrome. And there are certain ones that can shorten QT syndrome. And uh, the important thing is for us cardiologists to be able to identify and know them and pay attention, particularly when we get a patient uh, in the hospital with a COVID infection. And uh, so can you go a little bit over uh, the list of drugs that we have listed here that could be potentially a problem in patients with COVID-19 infection. Certainly. So if we think about the list of medications that are out there, uh, beta blockers in general are useful agents that can calm some of, some of the catecholamine surge and try to calm some of those arrhythmias. Many of the medicines that we use as antiarrhythmics can actually, are actually pro-arrhythmic as well in different ways. So when we think about agents that are uh, potassium channel blockers or class three agents. They will prolong the QT and can make things worse uh, for people who are receiving agents such as chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. That includes medicines like sodalol, amiodarone, uh, and uh, um, uh, dofetilide. Some of the uh, class one sodium channel blockers, as they're metabolized, they also can become potassium channel blockers and prolong the QT as well. So many of patients are on these uh, medications for atrial fibrillation, and others of them have been on them for uh, ventricular tachycardia, particularly if they have had ischemic heart disease. So those are the medications that we really wanna take caution. There are many other agents that are used as psychotropic agents and as antidepressants, um, antiemetics such as ondansetron or Zofran, and many of the antibiotics such as fluoroquinolones and azithromycin can uh, prolong the QT as well. And so unless we're certain what the infectious agent is, we really want to take caution in combining these agents with uh, our patients. So, uh... <clears throat> Mary, let me ask you this question. We have uh, a number of patients in the hospital with uh, COVID condition at the present time, and I don't know if you have admitted or you've been consulted on some of them, but would therefore uh, your approach would be when you see with COVID infection patient, you immediately look at his uh, or her drug regimen and figure out what is absolutely needed what is not needed, what could be potentially hazardous to patient's health, and then would you switch into a different medications, or what is your strategy at the present time? I, I think, yes, I mean, uh, that becomes, I think, a secondary issue. Uh, if, if they're critically ill, you have to obviously make changes with beta blockers and the calcium channel blockers and things of that nature and have to put them aside. So acutely, you, you try to go for, obviously, the best hemodynamic support you can. But um, kind of in a subacute um, uh, management of these patients, I do tend to, m most of these drugs um, that, you know, as, as uh, Dr. Lamb was pointing out, a lot of these drugs can have effects on that QT uh, prolongation. Uh, a lot of these drugs can't be used in patients with any structural heart disease. So patients who've had a history of blockages. And, and so that becomes, that makes things uh, somewhat uh, more challenging. But um, there are still regimens, there are still individual medicines that even though perhaps in the long term have more toxicities, acutely in the more short term um, are both effective with management of arrhythmias and at least acutely don't offer um, as much toxicities. And I think that those types of medicines become uh, things like amiodarone, for example. We may not like to use 
as much in the in the middle aged patients, but uh, in the short term, it's it's something that I would consider strongly. I see. So now we are dealing with this uh, complex uh, scenario where a patient has uh, multi organ issues and frequently multi organ failure. Not only just cardiac, but respiratory, renal, and uh, liver involvement, which is very common with COVID in patients. So the question then is uh, how do we uh, how do we from the cardiac point of view uh, stratify patients to determine what degree of monitoring is needed to make sure that we're actually not doing harm when we institute a certain therapy and as uh, Wilson mentioned you know hydroxychloroquine all of a sudden was popularized and there are other other drugs as well that have been used remdesivir and so on and uh, some of the patients don't have really uh, severe symptoms that would necessarily require hospitalization but somebody somewhere decided to start them on one of the medications that could potentially do harm and prolong QT syndrome and so on so how would you approach this do you approach it with uh, hospitalization in this typical typical scenario for monitoring, do you just do an electrocardiogram and measure QT uh, before and after, or do you use some kind of a uh, monitoring modalities with one of the wearables to uh, follow that patient? And uh, Wilson, let me ask you first, and then Madi, you can make your comments on it. Sure. I think that it makes perfect sense to take the entire patient together. I think using a risk score such as the Tisdale risk score can help to predict what's the likelihood that the QT corrected will be greater than 500 milliseconds. In a person who's relatively low risk, perhaps uh, using some agents on an outpatient basis with electrocardiograms may be reasonable. But for anyone who's in a high risk category, I think bringing them into the hospital and having monitoring makes sense and making sure that uh, kidney function and uh, liver function are also doing well as we take into consideration what other medications are they on, how are those medicines metabolized, and how could those also impact the QT? Maybe? Yeah, I, I just, I wanna both temper uh, perhaps an enthusiasm for some of these drugs, but also, temper the uh, kind of immediate uh, blowback, with, especially with this most recent study uh, that was, uh, it wasn't peer reviewed, but nonetheless, the, the um, incidence of arrhythmias. If my understanding of, of the doses is, again, Dr. Lamb was pointing out, these are very high doses that were being used uh, in, in, this, uh, in this particular study, at least, and certainly a, um, far greater than what we, you know, clinically use um, um, when we use these drugs for a variety of reasons. So that's just to temper. Um, I, don't, I don't think that uh, if I do agree, if we monitor, we take the patient as a whole, and if we monitor them appropriately, I think this can be done with um, relative safety. Um, I do think that the uh, scoring algorithm to predict uh, uh, a longer QT is extremely helpful in this situation because you have so many variables now coming at you from different directions. So in essence, I, I think what I completely agree with Dr. Lyle on this. Very good. So AI is uh, getting more and more popular and uh, bringing more and more information and modalities uh, in the uh, patients with uh, cardiac disease. And uh, I would like to ask uh, our guest today, uh, Surrender, if you can uh, mention to us what is uh, the technology at the present time where we can record reliably arrhythmias and how will this uh, impact uh, not only treatment of patients with cardiac disease, but also patients that might develop COVID. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Treasure. It's a great pleasure to participate in this panel with some elite people. Um, so uh, Life Signals, we've been developing a platform technology in general to do serious clinical monitoring. And so I'll basically provide introduction to the technology and then briefly discuss how we are taking that technology and quickly morphing it into kind of uh, creating products to specifically help the COVID-9 situation, including some of the things you've been discussing. So 
So anyway, the slide which you are seeing right now, it really outlines the vision with the dream we started this company uh, about more than 10 years ago. I think the whole idea was that, you know, hey, a lot of patients, in, uh, they're monitored today mostly in hospitals, and, uh, and they're typically tethered to some kind of monitoring devices, you know, where the, the infection issues come up and uh, because many wires are touching the body and uh, the patients are not mobile, they can't go to bathrooms and uh, so, so there, and the, the productivity is low because the wires get pulled off and so on. So there are a lot of issues. So our dream was, you know, can you really create a world where all these patients are untethered? And we really, but to study the problem, that what problem we're trying to solve, we kind of looked into physicians and especially the, the people of your class. What do they look for, really? What signals are most commonly monitored? So we kind of did an analysis and and really collected the data from 2030 reports that what uh, disposable biosensors get sold, and mostly they're connected through the wires to patient monitoring equipment. You can see this brief chart, which is not very visible, but you see that we figured out that about 5 billion ECG electrodes get used per year, and they're connected through wires and then SpO2 and some other vital signs, you know, that really tells a lot, you know, that what commonly is practiced in the clinical world. So our, our idea was, you know, can you create a, a, a patch, a wireless patches, which are really working at same clinical accuracy, same level, and you're really displacing this kind of monitoring which goes on in hospitals, you know, really using wireless uh, patches or biosensors, whatever you call. So, so to, to create that world, you know, we said, you know, this is what we need, we deal with because these are the procedures, you know, go on in hospitals. One to 12 lead ECG, actually one is not rare, was rarely conventionally done in hospitals. It's normally three to 12 leads. SpO2 is a very important signal, heart rate, respiration rate, uh, temperature is monitored, blood pressure is monitored, and uh, stethoscope or heart sounds of different kind, the blood flow, those things are very key when you're seriously diagnosing patients or really in a disease management uh, category when you're really uh, trying to provide therapy and uh, then monitor at that time. So, so our dream was, you know, really to create a technology which really has the characteristics shown on the right-hand side, you know, because our idea was, you know, this should be able to scalable to, to where millions and millions of people can use it. So number one criteria was actionable reliability. It has to be so reliable that serious clinical actions can be taken. You're, you're basically doing life and death situation. You're basically decisions you're making. Must be disposable because that's what hospitals like it. You place on a body, then toss it out. And no recharging or re, uh, changing batteries, all that is stuff. Clinical accuracy. Highly robust wireless connection, even when there are, let's say, 20, 30 people in close proximity in an emergency room, each one may be wearing a patch. How do you make it that the data wirelessly is flowing from the, each patient continuously into the monitoring device of some kind? So what we wanted to basically do was, you know, take some of that technology and quickly kind of try to morph it where it can be used for COVID-19. So you see these ideas we came up with was, hey, where is the bottleneck in COVID-19 today monitoring? First we found, first we figured out was, hey, screening people is tough. When people are not feeling well, they're very anxious, you know, am I getting symptoms uh, or is something gonna go wrong? Or even if you're giving some people drug, you know, that uh, then, you, and they may be at their home or whatever, can, can they be monitored and the, how their symptoms are doing? So. So idea was, you know, we called it a kind of symptom monitoring for uh, just as a classification. So this patch and we're creating now, we had a lot of um, uh, already kind of remote monitoring apps and so on for physicians and other things our, also our partners have. But then we created a kind of consumer oriented app for this patch, you know, where you can see the, the common things which COVID-19 really the symptoms produced are the temperature, body temperature, of course, the, the respiration rate heart rate, cough frequency we are about to add, and then we added the QT prolongation uh, tracking, uh, what you were just discussing, that uh, if, if really indeed the different doses of the drugs are being tried. Well, Surrender, thank you very much. This is very informative, and uh, this is exactly what we need in our practice, uh, a patch that's disposable, that uh, adds many different components, not just one, because there are companies that offer that as well. But this one is unique in a way. I would like to ask uh, 
co-participants. Uh, uh, Wilson, if you want to comment to what you think about this technology, how you would use it, and then Mehdi as well, I want to hear your comments as well. Certainly. I think a lot of the 21st century research is looking at big data, and big data depends on capturing a lot of points, time points, as well as data points, so that you're able to bring in all of the clinical information is hopeful, hopefully helpful so that we can figure out who are the high-risk patients, the needles in the haystack that are otherwise uh, attributed to being low risk, but they just don't know it yet. So I definitely think that there's a role. Uh, a lot of the monitoring systems do very well for our atrial arrhythmias. For the patients that we're not sure exactly what's causing those symptoms and we need to make a diagnosis, it may have a role in determining whether they're on anticoagulation or what type of rhythm strategy we perform. This is perfect for that. In the realm of COVID, uh, I, I think that there is a role for this. The high-risk patient, I think, is going to be unfortunately admitted to the hospital already because of uh, if they're really severe and going into an intensive care unit, they'll have their monitoring. For that low-risk patient who we're not sure about or that intermediate-risk patient that doesn't look sick enough to be admitted to the hospital, that's a place where you can send them home with the monitoring to keep tabs of those other vital signs. Uh, but I, I think you have to be uh, very select, knowing that many of the ventricular arrhythmias, the malignant ventricular arrhythmias, happen in a lot of the intensive care unit patients and the sicker patients who may be there already. But there may be those in the needle in the haystack. I think as studies try to determine Determine where chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine can be used. Is it in prophylaxis? Is it in an outpatient basis? That's where this would have a very important role to monitoring the, the corrected QT. Ready? Yeah. yeah I, I pretty much agree with, again, with uh, everything Dr. Lamb had to say. I just want to bring out the, the, the kind of uh, subtlety that he touched on that this is kind of the low, low intermediate risk patient perhaps may be our, uh, our, our biggest area of need. And then certainly um, the ability to precisely call out the QT interval uh, specifically towards COVID-19 and its uh, treatment. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm personally very uh, intrigued and uh, excited about this uh, multi-detector disposable patches uh, because as you mentioned, uh, Surrender, not only uh, this will be pertinent to COVID patients, but uh, to many other conditions, particularly when we add all those different sensors, uh, let's say stethoscope and listening to respiratory function and patients with peripheral vascular disease to have sensors and so on, I think we'll be able to manage our patients uh, better. So I think the future is very bright for this in this field. And I have to congratulate you and your company in uh, your vision and moving forward with this technology at such a rapid pace. Yeah. Yeah. The, what you said is very important. And, you know, really, if you can get all vital signs, our goal was not to put different pieces on the body. So even the stethoscope the technology, the way it is being integrated, this team has done 10 years of work, research in that area in heart sounds and uh, how to pick up the sounds and even the very fine blood flow analysis for uh, congestive heart failure patients and so on, even correlating with ECG. So a lot of good work has been done. So it's really the beauty is, you know, it is embedded in the same patch you are seeing. All these sensors, because we have the silicon which can take the sil uh, the inputs from all these things. We have the radios which can manage. We have the on-chip processors where you can write any specific algorithms. So so, so I think it works very well. So, uh, and, and your comment, by the way, uh, should not be really mistaken. That I, I think it was Dr. Lamb made comment, yeah, that uh, for, our, for uh, uh, basically outpatient, uh, I think our goal was also to be equally applicable within the hospital setting as well, where people are really basically move around, they can go to bathroom, and they're still being monitored constantly. And for uh, actually major OEM, which uh, I don't want to disclose the names, which really builds patient monitors and so on, I mean, their goal is to really launch this as a within this year in hospital setting as a low acuity kind of man monitoring patch, you know, just one patch which manages all the signals, you know, in a kind of one, when patients are released from ICU and so on, and they're being generally watched. I think this one patch will really will keep track of everything and people are free to move around. Sure. 
I think even your, I agree. I think in the hospital, uh, when there are many leads that are stuck on the body, it can lead to a little bit of economy of space. Uh, yes. If you have to go into a room and take care of a patient, you don't want to have to uh, muddle, muddy around with a lot of equipment. And so that can be helpful. And I agree. Yeah. I think that also if the pandemic truly surges and we have to move patients into a close to the hospital, but not necessarily in the hospital because of limited resources, uh, a chip like this would be outstanding. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, gentlemen, this was a great discussion and great presentation. Thank you very much for your generosity as far as the time is concerned and uh, your valuable contribution to our Texas Heart Institute educational program, particularly now when we are dealing with this COVID-19 epidemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.